Hello, my name is George Brown, and I want to welcome you to the 2023 Alumni Scholarship Application Review Training. I'm the director of the Alumni Scholars Program, and I have the pleasure of spending a few minutes with you today talking a little bit about our process this year. I know some of you guys have watched training videos on multiple years, and I thank you for bearing with us. Uh, it's something that we have to do to make sure that we level set and give everyone the same basic knowledge when starting this review process. Um, that helps ensure that no volunteer starts this process without having some context about what they're going to be reviewing, the types of students that they're going to be reviewing, how the process works, how to stay internally consistent. Um, you'll watch a portion of the video that's going to talk and focus on implicit bias. Uh, and then we'll have also <clears throat> a brief portion where uh, Tamara from the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarship will walk you through logging into the system if you haven't done it before. Uh, we just want to make sure that we give you guys the best start possible uh, so there's not frustration on that reading weekend. Um, you know, there are always questions that arise and that's fine, but we want to eliminate as many of those on the front end as we can. So with that, thank you for joining me for this next few minutes. And I promise to get through this as quickly as possible so you can go on about your day. Just to quickly go over the agenda, there's a few things that we'll be focusing on today. One is a brief staff introduction, so I will introduce you virtually to those uh, that will work be working on the program in addition to me. Uh, we'll go through the process quickly and I'll talk a little bit about what to expect and some dates and things like that. Um, we'll briefly touch upon other volunteer opportunities. So if you like reading scholarship applications, um, there's a couple other opportunities that I encourage you to get involved with. And then finally, I'll inform you of where you can direct questions should you have any after watching the video. So with that, let's get started. So as I mentioned, my name is George Brown. I'm the director of the Alumni Scholars Program. I help with volunteer recruitment uh, for the application review portion. And then in addition to that, I get the pleasure of working with the students that you all select uh, to receive alumni scholarships. At any one time, there's over 500 of them on campus, uh, and they automatically become members of this amazing program called the Alumni Scholars Club. Uh, and that club is really focused on two things. One is building community. Um, as you guys know, UCLA is a large institution, and the ASC, the Alumni Scholars Club community, really helps to enhance that uh, make it feel more personal, uh, give students that are our scholarship recipients more attention to help navigate through this campus, uh, and really help with the transition coming from either their high school or community college to the UCLA campus. In addition to that, there are plenty of leadership development opportunities. So, you know, we said, what are we looking for when we're selecting these students and how can we enhance those skills while they're here on campus? Um, so by being an alumni scholars, they get uh, priority into the alumni mentor program. Um, there's resume workshops, there's networking events, um, there's community building events. I would say in, in, in fall, winter, and spring, there is at least one alumni scholars event per week um, that these students can take a part of and really build their community and their student network in addition to creating relationships with alumni while they're still students. Um, so that is the day-to-day -day of my job. Then we have uh, Lexi Van Leiten. She is the program coordinator for student alumni programs and family engagement. And she'll be helping this year uh, with and then managing your expectations and your questions through the process. Uh, and then finally, who you'll meet in the next segment of this video is Tamara Singh. Uh, she's a program manager and associate director of the Alumni Scholars Program, and she's housed in Financial Aid and Scholarships Office, uh, and she is the backbone of this selection process. So um, she works with the academic work system. She actually communicates with the students and encouraging them to apply for this opportunity. Um, and then she manages all of their payments while they're here as alumni scholars. So um, as donors have you know, contributed to fund these scholarships, Tamara is the one that is actually going in and making that magic happen and applying them to student accounts. 
So this program has been around since 1936. Um, loyal alumni, dedicated donors, and volunteers all come together to make this program possible. Um, so we thank you for your volunteer support in reading applications and selecting students. We thank you for your donations um, that continue to allow us to be able to support these students in a meaningful way. And we also thank you for the encouragement that you give to students. Many of you guys are involved in the alumni mentor program um, <clears throat> and mentor students through that or other ways on campus. Uh, but however you connect and support these students, we want to give a heartfelt thanks um, because we couldn't do this program without you. So I wanted to spend a little bit about uh, a little bit talking about the benefits of being an alumni scholar. Um, it's more than just a scholarship and students on the front end are attracted because of two reasons. One, they are used to being overachievers, so they want to build up their resume and apply and receive as many scholarships as possible. The second reason is because um, they really want to uh, find financial support to help fund their UCLA education. Uh, and third, we are one of the only merit-based scholarships on campus. Um, so for many students, especially middle income students, it becomes more and more difficult for them to fund their college education, right? Because the university, as far as their, their financial numbers are concerned, doesn't view them as needy. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have the over $30,000 a year to support their students to live on campus and get an education. And so this program is an opportunity for anyone to receive financial support solely based on what they've accomplished, um, either in their high school or their community college, if they're a transfer scholarship applicant. Um, it just really is a benefit to this campus and to the students. Um, in addition to that money, um, they get membership in the Alumni Scholars Club. I briefly talked about some of those benefits earlier in the last slide, um, but it gives you access to cutting edge leadership development program, uh, alumni to student mentoring, networking opportunities with UCLA alumni, and also the eligibility to receive up to an additional $5,000 in need-based grants. So, as I mentioned, this is a merit-based program. We select our recipients based on their accomplishments. However, if you've been selected based on your merit and you still have a remaining financial need, then you're considered for up to an additional $5,000 a year in financial support in the form of grants that you don't need to pay back. <clears throat> Again, merit-based scholarship for incoming freshmen as well as community college transfer students. Many of you are probably wondering how much do they get? Uh, freshmen are awarded anywhere from $6,000 to $20,000 that's paid over their four years at UCLA in equal installments. Transfer students are awarded $6,000 and that is paid over equal installments the two years that they're here versus the four years for incoming freshmen. The nice thing about this program is that it gives students the opportunity to figure out their financial situation long-term, right? So there's no reapplication process in order for them to get their second, third, or fourth payment. It's guaranteed to them. So they can come into UCLA knowing as a freshman, they're gonna have four years of funding. As a transfer student, they're gonna have two years of funding and they know exactly what that amount is. Um, that <clears throat> is very helpful to families when they're making a decision on whether or not they can afford to come to UCLA. All right, so we're going to go through the selection cycle for the 2023 year. I can't believe we're in 2023 already. Um, I see an error on this slide, but we're going to keep moving forward. The deadline this year is actually March 3rd, 2023. Um, I seem to have updated all of the dates except that one. I will keep this going so you feel like you're having a human conversation and not one that's pre-recorded and edited. Um, so the scholarship deadline this year is March 3rd, 2023. Um, admission notifications are scheduled for the 17th. Um, it's an estimated date. If everything goes as planned, that is the date students will find out. Um, but there is no guaranteed date. So admissions doesn't say, hey, George, we're releasing the information on this date. Um, but historically, 
that has been the Friday in which uh, admission decisions will be available. And then we'll be ready to kick into action on March 18th and 19th. So that Friday, once admission decisions are, are made, then we are able to go into the system and remove scholarship applications from students that weren't admitted because students actually apply for this scholarship not knowing their admission status. Um, and then that way, the system will then go assign those scholarship applications to all of the readers that have said, yes, I want to participate and have completed the training. Um, and then the system will go in and actually give you a pool of applications to read. Um, I know it is a short turnaround for you guys. It's one weekend, um, but you don't have a ridiculous amount of applications to read. Historically, it's been eight to 10 applications, which for a seasoned volunteer that has done this multiple years is probably an hour to an hour and a half. For someone that has, is doing this for the first time, you might be spending two hours, two and a half hours for the process. Um, you know, it takes a little bit longer to get you familiarized with uh, reading the types of students that you'll be reading. Um, but anyway, it's not a huge time commitment. And that quick turnaround times allows us the following week to go out with notifications, right? Um, so one of the struggles that we had historically was students didn't find out early enough on whether or not they were receiving an alumni scholarship. Uh, and now we have advanced that date. So the following week of them receiving admission notification, they also get notification that they've been selected as an alumni scholar. Again, helping them plan to make UCLA affordable so they can attend. Um, Bruin Day, which is when we invite all new families to campus, um, <clears throat> and there's workshops and seminars and things throughout the day, that's going to be April 15th, 2023. We are also holding a welcome weekend that day. So basically from when the Bruin Day ends, that evening into the next day, we're inviting alumni scholarship recipients to come to programming that we've set that kind of welcome them to the alumni scholar family. They get to spend the night in the residence halls with a current alumni scholar. They'll have dinner in the dorms and get to sample that great food. And then we'll have some community building programming going on for them um, over that next day. Um, Transfer Bruin Day is gonna be May 13th, uh, 2023. So that was when we welcome all transfer students to campus. And the SIR deadline, which is the statement of intent to register, it's basically their commitment to come to UCLA is May 1st uh, for freshmen and June 1st for community college transfer students. All right, now we're gonna get kind of into the nitty gritty and talk a little bit about the scoring and the rubric. Um, you're gonna be looking at several categories through this process. One is extracurricular activities. The next is volunteer work and community service, unpaid, honors and awards they may have received, employment if they've had that, any additional information that they want us to take into consideration and know about us, and then two short essay questions in which they're required to respond to. Their extracurricular activities and community service is worth half of their points, 50 points in total. Um, and one of the reasons for that is this is a leadership and service award. Um, so we're really looking for students that have excelled in those areas. We know that they have great GPAs, right? Uh, because otherwise they wouldn't have been admitted to UCLA. So we don't even pay attention to that anymore because everybody has a superior GPA or we wouldn't be reviewing their application. So what are some things that can actually make these students stand apart? One of them being their extracurriculars and community service. Uh, 10 points are awarded to honors and awards that they may have uh, achieved. We've asked them to limit those because we don't want a laundry list of activities. Um, <clears throat> In the email that you will receive, or you have received that provided a link to this training video, um, there should be a guide there that has a glossary of extracurricular activities. It doesn't have everything, um, but it is a good basis. Uh, the next thing I would recommend you do if you see something that they haven't explained well, or you've never heard of, or you need more information on, uh, Google, you know, and type in the activity or the honor that they have, uh, put down and nine times out of 10, there will be some type of description that'll give you some context on what that is. 
Um, and then you'll start to see some uh, some repetitiveness in ac extracurricular activities that are listed. And so if you have 10 applications and nine of them have a particular honors or award, you know that, hey, this may not be that selective, right? Um, so really give some thought into what the honors and award is, what the caliber of that is. Uh, if you need some more clarification, you can go to the glossary that we've provided as an attachment. You can use Google to go in and figure it out. Um, nine times out of 10, you'll find a description there. Um, and use your best judgment. And then finally, there's essays. There's two essays. They're 20 points each. Um, and they are 20 points each. So you don't want to carry over and say, well, this essay deserves 30. And I'm going to give this one 10 for 40. Doesn't work that way. Each are 0 to 20. And then you'll combine those scores for the essay score. All right. <clears throat> Here's a little bit more about the uh, point breakdown. You will have a PDF version of this too, um, but the extracurricular activities, some things to consider is what is their depth of involvement? Were they just a member of the organization or were they a leader of the organization? Did they show growth within an organization? Did they start out as a member and then become, excuse me, a vice president or a president? Did they really grow within that experience or do they have a bunch of like one-offs where they've had minimal involvement in many different things. To me, that it's not going to weigh quite as much as taking on a leadership role within these organizations. Are there unique accomplishments, right? Um, have they had to overcome obstacles in order to, to get to where they are within their extracurricular activities or their service? Um, these are all things that should be taken into consideration. Um, now you'll see a reader note applicants who have faced special circumstances, family and or other work commitments may not have been able to participate in as many activities, right? So if you have a student that talks about in their essay that they've had to you know, work 25 hours a week in order to help support their family, they're not gonna have as much time to participate in extracurricular activities as someone that had no obligation, right? And so one of the things that you want to take into consideration is A, how are you going to consider that? And B, to make sure you consider that for each applicant in the same way. So if you read George Brown's application and he's had a job working 20 hours a week and you say, okay, well, George worked 20 hours a week. He doesn't have quite as many extracurricular activities as these three other applicants, but they didn't have any work that they needed to consider. So I'm going to, uh, you know, give George a couple extra points because he's had to overcome this obstacle to participate in the few extracurricular activities that he has. You want to make sure you take that same philosophy for Sally and Mark and Joe um, if they've had similar situations. So you want to make sure that your scoring stays consistent across the board. You're not looking at me as an individual that that should receive grace in the scoring uh, mechanism. You're really looking at the situation is scored this way and should be scored this way for everyone that has this situation. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Honors and awards, 10 points, not a huge part of the application, but um, some things to consider. Are there achievements and recognition for leadership? Are there unique accomplishments or efforts? Okay, and um, honor roll and dean's list and things like that. Those are things that you'll find that most students will have. So what have they done that really sets them apart from the other applicants that you're reading in your pool? Finally, um, Essays, you know, are their responses thoughtful? Does the applicant demonstrate passion for leadership and service? Are their essays creative, right? Or are they boring? Do they provoke thought? Um, does it appear that they put some effort into writing this response? Um, so these things to are things to take into consideration when reading those essays. Um, and then you'll tally all those points up and that will give you the total for the student. One thing that you, the system will allow you to do is change scores until you've submitted your final scores. 
And so what I invite you to do is read a couple applications before you even start scoring. And I say that because many times an application seems super impressive when you first read it. But then when you've read three more, you realize this super impressive person that you read in the first application is just average compared to the other people that are in your pile. So when you start off, um, it's always helpful to read through a few applications, get an idea of you know, the caliber of student that you're dealing with, the types of things that they're involved in, um, and then go back and start to set scores. Once you kind of have an expectation of what these types of students look like through this application process. Um, some things to keep in mind while you're scoring, remain consistent in your scoring methodolo methodology. And that really means that however you, whatever you put into place for one applicant should be true for all 10 applicants that you may read, right? We don't want a different scoring mechanism for each individual student. That is not going to create a fair process. So, you know, some people worry about, oh my goodness, am I grading too hard or am I grading too easy? As long as you're consistent with how you grade for all of the applications that you read, it will work out. Where we get into problems is where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be super hard on this person and I'm gonna be completely lax on this person without any rhyme or reason to why, right? And so it's very important that you, whatever criteria you set up for yourself internally, that you hold yourself true to that throughout the process, okay? Um, utilize your glossary for extracurricular activities and awards. Um, that is a PDF attachment to the email that we sent you that had the link to this video. Um, there was a lot of information in that email. I encourage you to read through it a couple of times. I always get questions that are answered in that email. So uh, make sure you pay close attention to that. Uh, all applicants will likely be impressive to a certain degree, right? Um, and take a look at all your assigned applications. So we talked about this a few minutes ago. Um, these are some incredible students. Just to get into UCLA, you're incredible. So um, really take some time to get an idea or a handle on the types of students that you're going to be reviewing through this process, and then go back and start to, um, to score them. Keep an eye out uh, for circumstances that may have made it difficult uh, for students throughout their high school career or their community college career, right? Um, are they a transfer student that may be a non-traditional student that has a family that's had to go back to school? Maybe they work 40 hours a week and raise a kid and then are also going to community college, you know, part-time and have made this accomplishment to be able to apply to UCLA. Is this a student who's had to take care of younger siblings or work to help put food on the table for their family? All of these are things that you can take into consideration. You just want to make sure that you take them into consideration for each individual applicant that you're reading. And um, their essays, <clears throat> are they enhancing their application or are they just rehashing things that they've already listed in their extracurricular activities and their honors and awards? Have they been thoughtful in these essays? You know, this is really their opportunity to paint a picture of who they are um, and give you information above and beyond what they've included in a list of extracurricular activities. So did the student take advantage of that opportunity? And if they did, did you get information that makes you confident that they are a good fit for UCLA and they are deserving of this opportunity? All right. Attached here, um, you'll see a volunteer certification link. Um, that volunteer certification link is something that you are going to need to click on. And I realize that it's difficult to click on it from a uh, presentation. So don't feel that you need to write this down exactly. This link will be in your email, okay, that had the link to these training videos. So if you go back to that email that was sent from me that has a bunch of information, it has your attached PDFs of the rubric and the glossary of terms, you will also see the volunteer certification link in there. Excuse me. And once you click that link, um, you are going to need to... Um, fill out some information, just your first name, last name, email address, and clicking that you're certified that you've watched the training video. Once that has happened, 
um, you will then be added to the database to actually review applications. So just for clarity, the only people that will be able to read applications uh, that, that weekend in March are people that have completed the certification link. Just signing up to participate and watching this video does not advance your name into the pool of volunteer readers. Only the people that show up on the certification link will be eligible to read scholarship applications for both the freshmen or the transfer students. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. When you get to that link, you are going to be asked for a volunteer certification password. That password is included here just to make sure you've gotten through at least this point of the video. And that is Bruins 2023. So you'll just type that in the box and you'll click submit. And then I will get a notification and be able to forward that information over to Tamara uh, so she can include you in that database. Thank you so much for listening to this training video. And on behalf of the Alumni Scholars Program, I wanted to thank you for your dedication to selecting the best and brightest Bruins. I had mentioned to you that there were gonna be other volunteer opportunities. So by uh, watching this video, you can participate in either the freshman uh, alumni scholarship process or the transfer alumni scholarship process. Um, and we invite you to participate in either one of those. You will not have to watch the training video again in order to do so. Also coming up uh, next month, we are going to have the Parent Council Emeriti Scholarship Volunteer Opportunity. Uh, so that's another one that you would be eligible to participate in uh, should you want to do that. Later on in the year, uh, be on the lookout for a volunteer opportunity for the True Bruin Distinguished Senior Award. Um, that is the only other opportunity to receive a scholarship from the Alumni Association, not receiving it as an incoming freshman or transfer student. Um, so that's a great opportunity. It's a one-time award that we give students uh, during their senior year. Uh, so I invite you guys to continue your participation with this program. I thank you and I look forward to seeing you on campus. Should you ever be on campus, please stop by the James West Alumni Center uh, and ask for me. I'd love to come down and meet you. And thank you so much and go Bruins. Um, just as a final reminder, I realize that people have busy schedules and plans change. And from the time that you registered to volunteer until now, uh, you may have had a change of plans. And so that works fine. Where we get into problems is when we don't hear that volunteers don't no longer want to or able to participate, um, and then they're assigned applications. And then those applications don't get enough uh, volunteer reads in order to be calculated fairly in the scoring process. So at this point, you don't need to notify us that you're no longer able to participate. Just don't complete the certification link because the certification link is what's gonna give us our final list of volunteers that have said, hey, yes, I wanna participate, I'm available to participate. Um, so if you've signed up and you, you're watching this video and you say, hey, you know what, I can no longer participate. If you haven't completed the certification link, we're fine. Uh, after you've completed the certification link, if there then is a change of plans and you can no longer participate, then please let us know. And you can email me at gbrown at support.ucla.edu. Let me know that there's been a change of plans and then I can remove you from the list and have those scholarship applications reassigned. Um, if you forgot my email address, I'm the one who sent you the email with the link to this video and a bunch of other pertinent information uh, for the process. Thank you very much in advance for your participation, your dedication to UCLA, and most importantly, your dedication to the leaders of tomorrow. Go Bruins. Hello, everyone. We are so excited this year to be able to add a component to our training video. Um, and that is with my colleague in financial aid and scholarships, Tamara Sang. Tamara is the mastermind behind Academic Works and uh, 
ensures that everything works smoothly as far as the application review process is concerned. And then in the next step to actually award the students that are selected their actual scholarship. Uh, we've noticed in previous years, there have been some questions the weekend of review. Um, and when I say some questions, I mean hundreds of emails that come through. So we thought that this year we would include a component in this training video that actually allows Tamara to walk you through the process of logging into the system and scoring individual applicants. And by doing this, we hope that it cuts down the amount of questions you have the day of. Um, and before you send an email with a question, you'll have the opportunity to go back and re-review uh, this portion of the training to see if those questions are answered in this training video. So with that, I turn it over to Tamara. Thank you for being here with us today, Tamara. Hey, thank you so much, George. Um, and thank you to all of you who volunteer to read our alumni scholarship applications. We really could not do this without you. Um, so I've put a few highlights up on the screen. And basically, I just want to share with you that recruitment scholarships like our alumni scholarship program really are essential in helping us roll the very best students that have been admitted to UCLA. And some of the timing behind doing this is key. So award offers made within one week of admissions decisions are really helpful for our incoming students and their families so that they have the time they need to compare the financial aid packages they're receiving from all the schools where they have been admitted. Um, so therefore, your assistance in completing your application reviews over the weekend so we can award within that time frame is so, so appreciated. It also helps us prepare for Bruin Day events and making sure we have the time to invite students to events like the ASC Welcome Day um, that George hosts. So a few essential steps before beginning your reviews. Um, obviously, completing your training and certification process with George and the Alumni Association but also some technical things like making sure you add the email address UCLA scholarships at fas.ucla.edu to your safe senders list. This is where your invitation and notifications to, um, about your applications assigned to you will be coming from and you don't want that going to spam. So if you can add that to your email address uh, list now, that would be great. And you'll be ready to go once those emails start launching. This is what um, a sample email, what that will look like when it arrives for those of you who are new. Um, it will inform you how many reviews have been assigned to you. Uh, it will give you essential links about our reviewer contracts and it will also give you a link to begin. And just some reminders for us because this usually is a very large application group, um, assignments can shift throughout the weekend. Um, and that is because the application is very student driven. So it is working to make sure that students' applications are read as quickly as possible to meet our minimums. Um, therefore, if you do not mark the application in some way to show that you have started to review and score it, the system may move it to another reviewer um, to make sure that application is read in a timely fashion. And I'll show you how to mark those while um, when we get into the system itself for the demonstration. We also have a brief uh, review video for you that's less than five minutes. Uh, if you do want to take a look, um, just to give yourself a refresher, the links are provided here as well. Okay, so when you click through on your activation link, it's going to bring you to our prospective student portal. And you'll see right here, there are actually two tabs on the sign-in screen you will make sure that you're going to the references and reviewer tab when you sign in. And if you have been here before, I recommend that you do save um, your password into your browser. Um, and if it is your first time, you will set up your account. The system will send you a one-time secure activation link and you will then just need uh, your personal email address and the password of your choice um, to sign in. The system will provide you guidance with all of the password security levels, you know, number of digits that you need to provide and such as you're setting things up. And then you would just click on the blue sign in button to begin reviewing. Now, if you do forget your password or and you can't remember, you just click this trouble signing in link right here, it will walk you through um, resetting your password. Or if you do try to sign in and it maxes out your tries, just wait for 10 minutes and it will let you try again as well. 
Um, but sometimes there are security updates throughout the year and an existing password no longer meet those minimums. So you may just want to go straight to the trouble sign in link and reset it to make sure you're meeting any new security minimums that have been set in the past year. All right, let me quick move this out of the way and we're gonna go and show you what the portal is looking like. Okay, so key here is once you sign in, it's gonna take you to this screen. And unless you're a chair for the group, you'll likely just see these two columns on the left and the right. And this will provide you a description of the scholarship each year in case any changes have occurred um, since the last cycle. And then you'll see your number of assignments that have been made to you. And it will keep track as you submit your scores of how many are completed. So you'll see this zero updating as you move along. Click on this link. And it's gonna give you a list of anonymized, anonymized, main anonymous numbers for the students. Um, and it'll tell you what date they've been assigned, if they are qualified, which you should only see yeses for this, and a bunch of blue buttons to begin your reviews. Let's click on the first one here. Now I have mine set to review side by side. When you enter the first time, it will not show that. You'll see this where you can see the review information. You can then click on the tab and see the application. But as you might guess, the most helpful view is to see both of these side by side. So that way you can see the sections of the application as well as that the score and the scoring range is available to you. These are set in the order. Um, to match these scoring categories. So for example, you see the extracurricular activities and community service come up first, and you can see right over here, this is this first category as well. So what we provide you at the beginning is some of the links from your the invitation email. You'll see that training video that we just offered, the contract again. You'll also see some additional materials. So you're gonna see uh, a link back to the complete alumni application training video George will provide you're gonna see the PDF of the freshman application rating scale or rubric. That is basically these categories here that have a bunch more helpful instructions on what you're looking for. And then you'll also see the holistic review glossary, which will show you a lot of the common activities, groups, awards, and things like that, which will be part of the student's applications. So I'm gonna slide this down a little bit here. If anything is hidden in these sections, you can see there's a little minus next to general application. So plus and minus, and then as well as the supplemental questions exclusively for alumni. So if you can't see the answers, just click on the button next to each area and it will expand those for you. So you're gonna start out with the student's personal information. Um, you're gonna have a confirmation that they are a freshman or a transfer student. So just double check to make sure that that looks correct since we do have the second um, reading pool coming later. And it'll give you some basic information about their prospective major and also the prospective career plans. And then it will go into the areas you really wanna focus on. So we are giving the students a chance to include up to 10 extracurricular activities and community service since this is a key component up to 50 points on the application then move to the next category. Do the same, they can provide up to five of these for volunteer work and community service. So again, you'd be looking at both of these through this category. I tend to do the partial points as I'm going. For example, I, if I say they have 25 points for the first one, and then I say for volunteer work, if I wanna give them like another 20 more, then I just, you know, so I don't have to keep track of the math while I'm going, but whatever works for you. Um, you can look at both of them before you do your score as well. Honors and awards, you can also have a maximum of five. This area is worth 10 points, so you can score between zero to 10. You see we are working in increments of one, so um, you will not be able to do half points or anything like that as well. Um, employment, internships, and research. Um, while it doesn't have its own category, um, I know that George has explained in the training video how you work these into the extracurricular activities, community service honors, and how a job can impact the scores on these two areas in particular. Uh, if they have provided any additional information or a personal statement, you'll see that here. 
And then the supplemental questions. You'll see a leadership quote. We've used this for a few years now. Um, and then you would come over here. I believe there were 20 points each. So you can score. And then again, the second leadership questions about how they uh, stood apart in students at their current learning institution is also uh, worth up to 20 points. Now it's really helpful for us if you um, add anything particular about this applicant into your reviewer comments here. It is an optional field, but it is really nice for us to fall back on later when we're reading, particularly if I have some tiebreakers I need to look at to see what your comments were um, when you're reading the application. So go ahead and please put those in here. Um, what I do recommend is that in the past, some folks have tried to do save or you move on at this point. Even if your numbers aren't set in stone here for what you would like to give us a final score, particularly, you know, we always recommend reading several applications before you score. I don't want you to lose this application though as part of your portfolio. So what I do recommend is that either you use this bookmark check here, or you go ahead and submit your scores here to save this application into your portfolio. So even if you do need to come back and make any changes to it after you've read some of your other applications and decided you either wanna move this one scores up or down, you have that option. So hit the blue submit button and then the system will move you to the next application. And again, you'll have a new number here and the system will reset and you will start this process over again where you can check and uncheck. Um, to save these until you are comfortable with the scores that you have. Now, as you work through this process, um, it will simply keep updating. I'm gonna bring you back to what that screen will look like. And I'm gonna slide down to the bottom here. The screen should be a little shorter. System is assigned everyone to me right now and you'll have you know, a small chunk of the assignments once we're done. But you can see that a few of these buttons have changed. So anything you haven't started yet will still have the blue button saying begin. But if you are in any sort of process with this, uh, with the application, even if you have saved or submitted a score, it's going to give you this finish button or an update button, something like that to indicate you can still come in up until the deadline and finalize this score. Um, our deadline is always at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night. Um, and after that, you'll see these buttons gray out so you're not able to click through and make any changes to the application. Now, one key thing to note is that the system generally does not come back and send a confirmation email that you are done. While you will continue to get reminders if you do have open applications to review during that two days, the system only sends out messages once per day and they tend to be between midnight and one or 2 a.m. giving you a reminder about either that your assignments were made is the first one. Because of our short timeline, you might get one on a Saturday night saying how many you have left to complete or if the system has had to um, make any reassignments, for example, because as George mentioned, you know, someone had a family emergency come up and you know, had to withdraw and we've had to reassign, the system automatically reassigns these. So you might find yourself getting one or two new applications throughout the weekend um, as this portal tries to get those remaining student applications read. So you might finish up on Saturday. And then if you do get an email that night saying, you know, X number of applications have been assigned to you and you're like, but I'm already done. Just please click through and take a look because it could be those are some new assignments moved from a reviewer who could no longer participate. Or um, it could just be those are your remaining if you didn't have a chance to finish on the first day. Um, obviously, I recommend trying to finish as many as you can the first day if your schedule allows, just in case something like that does happen and we need you to read one or two extras on Sunday. But you'll come back and it will say you'll finally have an updated information that tells you you have completed uh, the number of assignments to you. So in theory, you know, mine would say something like 246 of 246 completed. And that is how you will know that all of your assignments have been read and submitted. 
but you're not necessarily going to get that email um, in the past that has said you have completed all your reviews. It is a more proactive system of just giving you the indication that it is done. So that's basically how to review in our portal. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at the UCLA scholarships email address um, that is sending you your system notifications um, and that we provided earlier today. But um, again, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to help us with this um, since it is such a vital part of our recruitment process. Um, and we love Sam being able to see our future Bruins and see them at Bruin Day and have alumni scholarships offers already out to them. And it's so meaningful for their families when we meet with them. So again, thank you. And thank you, George, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk today. I really appreciate it. Tamara, we can't thank you enough for providing this extra piece of training, which I am sure is going to be helpful to our volunteer pool. I just wanted to reiterate one thing <clears throat> at this portion, and that is the importance of your reading. Um, we understand that from the time that you register to volunteer uh, until that weekend when we open up the portal to actually review applications, sometimes plans change. Um, and if you notify that us of that in advance, we are able to reassign or redistribute the applications that have been assigned to you. Um, however, it becomes very challenging when um, you've signed up to read and then things change, but we don't know that and we're still expecting you to read those applications. Um, what that does is delay the process of this being completed um, and it really um, affects the student's ability to have a fair process um, during this review cycle. So the only thing that we ask from you is A, that if you have been assigned applications that you do everything in your power to complete the evaluation. And B, if your schedule changes, just let us know that in advance so we're able to make the adjustments on the back end to assure that these students have the same opportunity as those whose reviewers are available to read. Um, and then finally, I'd like to say, you know, at some years, there are as many as 2,000 volunteers reading applications, and Tamara is one person, right? And so um, anything that you can do to review the training materials, this video, to make sure that any question that you have isn't answered um, in a way that can be solved by watching these videos would be helpful. Um, because hundreds of emails come in that day, um, and it takes some time to get those responded to. So. Uh, that was one of the reasons why we felt that it was imperative that we provided a walkthrough of how to log into the system and submit your scores. Um, so please use this as your first line in answering your questions that review weekend. And then if you're still having problems after reviewing this information, that would be the time to reach out via email. But Tamara, on behalf of the UCLA Alumni Association, we are so grateful in everything that you've done to A, advance the product process so our scholarships are more impactful to the students that are receiving them um, as well as taking out time of your day to explain and walk us through the process of actually reviewing an application and with that uh, we will sign off and good luck on your review weekend and we are here to support you should you have any problems as our diverse communities continue to grow our goal is to ensure that they receive the support and recognition for the many accomplishments they achieve. If you are unfamiliar with us, I encourage you to visit our website. Diversity Programs and Initiatives was created a few years ago to discover ways for the association to engage with the many communities present at UCLA, as well as with our general alumni community, as we work to uplift efforts relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our website not only highlights the programming we provide to do this, but also includes the different identity-based alumni networks that we support. As many of you know, UCLA values and is committed to its diverse community. But did you know that our Bruin community is actually one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse campuses in the country? But of course, when speaking about diversity, we're referring to a multitude of things in addition to race and ethnicity. For example, gender, sexual orientation, and any other life experience that contributes to the rich narratives that make up UCLA's story. We hope that you're excited to be reading about students that come from all walks of life, and that you remain open to these considerations as you engage in this process. 
Our hope is that this video provides you with some of the ways to become more aware of any internalized thoughts you may have, as well as some basic tools to remain inclusive. With that being said, one of these tools is being critically aware of our own unconscious or implicit bias. Everyone has them, and because of that, it can be incredibly hard to identify. So how can we go about exploring our unconscious bias? particularly as we prepare to review applications where in this instance, you won't be able to talk to individuals directly and you're essentially reviewing someone's life only by what they've been able to articulate about themselves through writing. So given this unique circumstance, we want you to be more aware of biases that you may have when you're looking at a piece of writing about someone else. Thankfully, as a research one institution, we have conducted and have access to a plethora of research that has explored how unconscious bias impacts us all from things like hiring processes to common interactions. What we have seen is that while unconscious bias is evident in creating unfair standards, there are many techniques available to us to minimize and intervene against it. So for today, we'll be focusing on three strategies that seek to address unconscious bias that will be relevant for our process. The first is education. The second is reflecting on your own identity and how that may impact how you think. And lastly, the third strategy will think about who you interact with. Our first strategy is education. We rely on the fact that learning is a lifelong process and that the only consistent thing about society is that we continue to expand and evolve how we come to define ourselves and others. This simple premise also holds true in the realm of diversity. So when it comes to thinking about different experiences, we need to understand that learning is never something we finish doing. One of the most helpful concepts to think about when encountering perspectives or experiences I don't understand is thinking about implicit bias. We define implicit bias as attitudes or stereotypes we may hold outside of our conscious awareness. So implicit bias isn't referring to biases you may be aware of that you're trying to conceal or suppress, but rather things you aren't even aware that you may have internalized. When we break this definition down further, attitudes can be equated to your evaluation in regards to a concept, person, place, or thing such as what we'll be doing for this process. For the sake of this training session and for the sake of the scholarship application process, we'll be focusing on the people. So attitudes can either be positive or negative. The second part of the definition mentions stereotypes, which are beliefs that are strongly associated with a given category. Stereotypes are normally reinforced in society by media or from personal experiences you may have had with one person. They may cause you to associate that one person's identity and their individual behavior with the whole entire group they share an identity with. Some common stereotypes you may be familiar with are, Asians are good at math, men are often associated with the workplace more than women, and many other stereotypes that come to mind. The main takeaway here is that while you may personally not believe a stereotype, which is often the case when it comes to implicit bias, they can still influence the way you think and shape your worldview. So being aware of these things is crucial to helping us address unconscious bias that can occur during this process. Now, this is of course a very abbreviated lesson and there will be links available along with this presentation if you wanna personally learn more about it. But for the purposes of today's training, we want you to think of it as a tool to better understand how you can help us create a more inclusive process. The second strategy you can implement is self-awareness. Our decision-making is inherently informed by not only the way we process information, but also by the experiences we have as individuals, from the way we grew up, to our day-to-day -day interactions and to who we keep in our social, social circles all impact the values we recognize. How this relates to unconscious bias is being able to introspectively examine and identify any biases you may have for any one given group or groups, and then taking the active effort of recognizing and minimizing its impact. However, accomplishing this is often easier said than done. 
There are several tests that have come out over the past years that provide a great introductory scope of helping people begin to explore what types of implicit or unconscious bias they may have. One such example is Harvard's Implicit Association Test, which you can take yourself using the following website address. However, I would like to note that as with any research methodology or tool, updates and peer reviews always help to strengthen and increase accuracy for practical use. Therefore, I would also recommend participants review research that has been gathered by the university's own UCLA Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Bearing in mind the new information that is available in combination with existing tools allows all of us to stay best informed in our continuing goal of being aware of unconscious bias. The last strategy we'll review today is looking at your own social network. Who we surround ourselves with both by proximity and virtually is actually one of the most powerful influencers of how our understanding of diversity is shaped. So when considering how to address bias or seeking to understand and learn more about diverse communities, thinking about this strategy can be beneficial by helping to provide a starting point with those who surround you in your life. It can be difficult to attempt to learn about others' authentic experiences, especially when you may not have a direct link to those communities. Logically, it makes sense that this would be the first step to take. However, learning about others outside of our immediate communities can still happen by connecting with community members we identify with as well. So for example, if I identify personally as Asian American, I can connect with other Asian Americans to better understand how our race has shaped my larger perspective of race and race relations. It's also a space to allow myself to think of groups I am not a member of. Speaking to members of communities you do belong with in combination of those you do not provides a more holistic perspective to how you can better be an ally by viewing where gaps may be between perceptions and reality. In terms of bias, Learning in the face of sameness and difference can play out as a great tool to identify areas to examine. We have 11 different identity-based alumni networks for you to connect and grow with if you're ever interested in taking that opportunity. So now combining these three different strategies, let's examine how we can apply them to the alumni scholarship process. There are a few things you can think about when you go through the reviewing process so that when you conclude your evaluation of applicants, we encourage you to assess candidates using concrete and tangible experiences in that moment. Compared to thinking about your review from an overarching perspective, really think about the information that's right in front of you. Secondly, be aware of your own biases. If you aren't personally identifying with a candidate or their experience, ask yourself if your rating is being impacted by that alone. Do you find yourself unsure because you don't know that community well to make an informed decision? So actively think about your responses and decisions that can be impacted by stereotypes and counter them with positive thoughts about individuals from groups that you may not have much experience working with or know personally. Lastly, as much as social identity is a salient part of any candidate, think about the individual as a singular and holistic person. Everyone is incredibly complex and holds multiple experiences and facets to their identity. And it's in those nuanced differences that we really want you to evaluate a candidate. What is this person sharing with us? What informs their life perspective? Now, this is not in any way, shape or form saying to be colorblind or to ignore identities that people share because understanding who someone is as an individual is inherently linked to how they have come to perceive and be perceived by others, and therefore an important part of their journey. So don't think solely about people's identity, but think about the ways they have expressed it and how it's impacted their path to UCLA. As I mentioned earlier, you really wanna make an effort to think about the individual. Now, while this topic is something that can certainly be expanded upon, we hope you find it helpful as you begin the process. As always, we are available for questions and support. And again, thank you for joining me today and thinking about how to help us build a more inclusive scholarship process. We appreciate you all.
Thank you.